Awesome to welcome Grand Canyon head coach Molly Miller to the podcast. Miller holds the highest career winning percentage, 89% of any NCAA men's or women's basketball coach at the Division I, Division II, or three levels with at least five years of experience. The two-time Division II coach of the year ended her Drury career with the Division II national runner-up in 2019 and an undefeated top-ranked 2020 team when the national tournament was canceled because of COVID-19. Miller made an immediate impact at Grand Canyon by guiding her lopes to the program's first WAC tournament championship game appearance. She did it by instituting her style of full-court pressure defense and up-tempo offense, which we're going to talk about today. Coach Miller, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. This is, I love talking basketball, so this is a great uh, break in my day. Yeah, it's great. And well, you love coaching basketball too, and you've had tremendous success. So it's going to be fun to talk about that. Uh, you reference buy-in quite a bit in uh, some of the articles and the different things that I've read and seen about you. So maybe if let's start with that, let's just talk a little bit about what that means for you, buy-in. I mean, on one hand, I think it's an overused, kitschy, cliched term that cannot have a lot of substance, but that's where we try to put some definition around what buy-in means to our program. And first and foremost, it's the defensive side of the ball. A lot of these kids we recruit are, you know, the best team on their high school squads. And when we inherit them, um, they've got a good knack for the other side of the ball, offensively scoring. And sometimes defensively, they're not as aggressive that we want them to be because they were they were told, you know, you, you can't foul out or they were if they did foul out their team or, or get into foul trouble, they'd be um, their team would struggle a little bit. So they probably took that end um, a little bit different from a mentality standpoint. And so when you step foot in our program, I think the proof and that was one thing I had to get when I talk about buying when I inherited um, this program last year at GCU was okay, defensively is where we're going to make a splash and win ball games. And what does that mean? So you teach it and, you know, you're going through it and they're like, what is, you know, she's, what is she thinking? Like making us do down to the nitty gritty, just the details. And it's just from the get go, kind of a, a staple of our, our program is focusing on the details and doing about at that point, early stages, 75% of our practices were defense. And so I'm sure it was a little bit of a grind to get through them. And then it's funny because that first game, we broke a couple of records and turnovers forced and steals and points. And a lot of those points were off turnovers. So like, Oh, I get it. So can, when you can really connect things to buy in it's, positive reinforcement, right? I don't know what psychologists, you know, kind of came up with the Pavlov dog thing. I mean, they heard the bell and they start salivating. Like it, that's to us as defense. So you show results. I think it has to be results driven when you're talking about buy-in. Um, you know, one thing is, as I talk to a lot of coaches on this podcast, kind of a little backdoor, we, we, we kind of not manipulate, but we, we do some things that reinforce positive buy-in. I had a meeting with my media people, one of the first days that I got the job. And I'm like, listen, something that's a staple of my program as well is energy on the bench. And I call that bench energy, energy. So um, I said, every time there's a basket or a made, you know, good play, I want you to pan over to the bench and put some of that in our highlight films. So you better believe it that no one wants to be the one sitting and doing a golf clap when everyone else is getting excited on the bench. So that was just a way to ignite and drink the Kool-Aid, if you will, of the Benergy. They knew that camera was going to be on them. So then it became natural. You know, they they wanted the positive reinforcement of being featured on a social media highlight or, you know, in practice film the next day. Look at this Benergy. This is so great. I love how you're cheering and high fiving. So you always have to reinforce things if you want buy-in. You can't just talk about it and then expect it to happen. There has to be some positive reinforcement in my my space i think um the days of negative reinforcement is gone and so we've got a lot of kids that are pleasers and um you know rightfully so you've got to give them the the atta girls or the atta boys here and there so to me that's what buy-ins have a goal have a picturesque of what it looks like and and show them when you're doing good look at this and look at the special things that can happen with this sort of buy-in well, it's such a great part of it is that noticing progress and noticing the success and the buy-in goes with it. And I got to imagine with buy-in and you talk, reference starting with defense because, 
you know, the possessions changed quite a bit from your Drury years to your first year at Grand Canyon. I think it went 80, 80 plus possessions at Drury down to 55. And that's a conscious effort on your part to start with defense, wasn't it? Yeah, you had to because they were used to playing kind of like a half court, slow, pack it in, not get out in passing lanes, just play kind of as much shot clock as you can. And we were now pressure trapping in the full court, making it hard to get in, jumping passing lanes. So to switch that mindset, it was a, it was a challenge, but you just, um, one of my favorite quotes from Cheryl Burnett, she was um, back in the SMSU days, now it's Missouri State, when they went to the final four with Jackie Styles. You know, she said, repetition penetrates even the dullest of minds. So, you know, not that we're calling our kids that they're not smart, but like it reps, that's that forms habits. So it needs to become habitual to do some things. So you can't just talk about, hey, we're going to get out in passing lanes. We have to do it every time. And then I stop and blow my whistle if we're, you know, jumping back off the ball instead of up the line on the line. And we'll do a drill, which Another little tidbit I I call a skinny, which is a drill within a drill. So let's say we're doing the shell drill and um, they can't get, they're not getting in the passing lane. That ball's just crossing the nail and and getting reversed. Well, I'll stop and then we'll do a one pass away drill to where they're knocking down the ball, getting the passing lane. Then we'll go back to the shell drill and it's fixed. That one pass away um, drill is fixed. So that's another thing, positive reinforcement, you know, buy-in. Well, we're just going to, it's, it's very matter of fact, you're not in trouble, but we're just going to stop. We're going to do this skinny. We're going to take some time and we're going to learn it. And then you can carry that over to the, to the next drill or the bigger picture. So everything's very matter of fact in the system too, which, um, I love cause they're not guessing. It's not a guessing game. So I showed them on film a lot. This is how we're going to play because initially in COVID, all we were doing was beating via zoom. I think that helped. And if I could redo it again, and you know, if I took over a program in non COVID, I'd probably do it the same way and kind of show them a little bit like this is going to be the brand, get them ready, get their mindset ready, try to flip it early. And so defensively, it was kind of a change of pace for them, but they bought in pretty fast just because of the nature of the practices. And I think as coaches, we did a really good job of focusing on details and not letting anything slip. We'd stop and do a lot of skinnies to make corrections. So skinnies, I wanted to talk about that. I call them reconnections. And this is this concept of you've taught something and now you're in some game-based play, small-sided game, and then they're not doing something well within it. So you're saying that you're going to a more of a block drill or a more of a drill to be able to reconnect it for the player. And then do you go back to the situation where they would apply it in a game context? Yeah, it's literally like a minute to two minutes and it's like, stop, give me a line right here. We're all going to get it out in the passing lane and knock it down three times and then get back to the drill. And really it's, it's, you know, again, it's positive reinforcement, just showing them the why and how, instead of you're not doing it right, get on the line, give me three touches, you know? Um, So I think for, for us, that's been a really positive um addition to practice is stop in the middle of the drill if we're not doing something break it down even to a, a smaller perspective which is why we call it a skinny i guess i don't know where i came up that but oh, i love the terminology it's great yeah <laughs> just a, a drill within the drill essentially well and i think it's one of the least understood and least used teaching concepts that i think is the most important and it saves you a lot of time too because you don't need to go through all these progressions of build up of drills Sometimes you can just, again, teach within the drill the thing that they're not doing well, let's say a closeout. So this is based, this is also coming back to the difference between teaching and testing, which is within this drill, if they're not doing something well, you have this skinny to be able to teach or reteach, correct? Yeah, I I will always explain the why. And if they're not getting it, then they're probably not making a connection of, well, why do we do this? So Um, You know, for example, for us, we use a specific on ball technique and I call it a measuring stick or arm that we kind of extend out straight and then we're always palm towards the ball to stop the crossover. So essentially you're denying that crossover dribble with one of your hands as you slide. Um, and you know, they weren't getting that. And I was, I said, do you know the why, why are we denying the crossover? And they were just kind of like, well, I, I mean, I go, what's the quickest move in basketball? Like, oh, the crossover. And, uh, 
a big part of our defense is kind of coming in from behind and, and trapping and going on turns. So if they can't look up the court and crossover, then the next move is probably a reverse pivot or maybe kind of a slower behind the back with pressure. So to us, we want to make sure that we deny the crossover. And then once they got that concept on ball defense, like they played to deny the crossover and you'd be amazed at how many just steals we have for being in the right position, but then they get the why it's like, if they cross over, we can never get into our defense. So they've used that tactic and that technique now to really be the starting point for what we do everywhere else on the court defensively. So I think explaining the why is a big part of teaching and learning instead of just, Hey, let's go out and do this drill. They've got to understand how it works into the grand scheme of things and not even, you know, rebounding. You could say, Hey, we're doing this drill because we need to be better rebounders. Well, that doesn't say much. So, you know, I'm, I'm like, we've got to do this drill because we're pretty slow on starting our break and our break starts with the rebound. So I want to see how quick we can get the ball in our hands on a rebound and get it to an outlet and cross half court. And I'm going to time us. You know, do you see how the messaging is different there? It's it's not like, oh, we need to become a better rebounding team. Well, now we have a goal. And the why is because we're a transition team and your last job and we're a defensive team. So the very, very, very last thing you need to do to complete a great defensive possession is get a rebound. But the very first thing you need to do to start a great offensive possession is the rebound. So, you know, just I think you taking some time to explain those things makes all the difference in the world. That's very logical. And, and you talked about getting the ball over half. Was, is there a specific, and you're measuring it. So there's also this way of being able to evaluate it. Is there a certain time that you want to get the ball over half then? We'd like to under two seconds. Yeah. I mean, that's something to, depending on where that rebound bounces off to and where we can get the outlet and if they're pressuring. I mean, if we have a lot of teams that just sprint completely back on us. So we'd like our point guard to catch about that volleyball 10 foot line is a good marker on a lot of courts. Um, and that's, you know, you're getting it. 1.5 seconds you're getting that rebound throwing that outlet one dribble you should be past half court and and we kind of use across the nail concept with our point guard so um that's something that you know every team's going to be a little different depending on the pace they want to push but we definitely want to push push pace so you're trying to attack the weak side in transition mainly yep yeah and is that the preference so you talk you reference teams getting back against you and i know that's going to only grow as teams get more understanding of what you're trying to do so are you trying to hit ahead cross court more than dribble across court, cross the nail, you said? Yeah, and a lot of times it's it's a timing thing. We're trying to um, evolve a little bit in our offense and what we're doing based on our personnel. So it depends. If you've got a really, really good point guard that can cross the nail and be your playmaker and look kind of to make a play happen, maybe you want the ball in their hands a little bit more. Um, if you've got some wings that are good at maybe coming off a ball screen in your secondary or making a play after they catch the ball in their secondary, I think it's very, with us, it's very personnel driven. We're never going to like be convicted to something on offense every single year. It's going to change with our personnel. What we are going to be convicted is how we play defense and that's not going to change every year. So that's kind of how we recruit into the defensive system. And then we'll kind of morph and evolve offensively based on who we have, who can be our playmakers, get the ball in their hands, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well, let's start with the defense then and dive a little bit deeper then um, full court pressure preference, and then pressure constantly in the half court in terms of denial. Uh, can you talk a little bit philosophically about this? Yeah, we do. Um, just, I guess if you're going to have a one underlying goal, it's to speed teams up and make them uncomfortable. And I think that's what we do really well. And of course, you're going to give up some layups in this, but I think that's um, the benefit outweighs, you know, a few layups a game that you're going to give up because teams just expect and get rattled even walking off the bus to shoot around they kind of know what's coming and so we'll we'll try to make it hard on the inbounds and then we'll have a lot of ball pressure and we're always some people call it a run and jump it's a little bit more sophisticated than that but we're always looking for opportunities if you will to to be able to sneak in a passing lane or go double the ball um when we get in the half we try to make it really hard and and that that concept too is we're we're going to try to deny passes not let them reverse the ball but we also do a really good job of weak side so if we have a back cut or you know dribble penetration we're always trying to help the helper and rotate so our 
a lot of our skinnies have to do with second and third effort. You know, how do we rotate? How do we fly around? We, we use the term take mine a lot instead of switch. Um, because that kind of tells you like, if, if someone's saying take mine, I could be, I, I need to be able to guard one through five. And so that's kind of the concept there is, is a take mine concept. I've really made a play and maybe I've overplayed and they've, they've thread the needle on a pass. Well, who's next up take mine. And then that's also saying, you know, you take mine, I'll, I'll get back in the play and take someone's cause it's not always going to be a switch. You might have to pick up someone on the weak side who's left open after rotation. So um, that's a good term that we use in the half. Um, I'm also yelling on the sideline, don't let it happen a lot, which I, I want our kids' eyes to get as big as saucers when there's a dead ball, either on the sideline or the baseline, because we're full out denying and, and we're switching everything. So we're trying to get a five count. I would say if that was statted, we'd lead the nation in, in five counts um, on the inbound. So I think for us, we're just trying to pressure as much as we can not let easy passes. It's a, it's amazing. Especially when I was at jury, we'd play teams and, you know, 90% of the time they were running, you know, a Princeton action or a, a Euro ball screen, whatever their offense was that we game plan for. We never saw it. Like they abandoned ship. And so when you can get a team to stop doing what they've potentially been practicing the whole year, get them out of rhythm and just say, yeah, we can't do that against, you know, this team, they're going to blow it up. We've got to just kind of go with motion or just play basketball or try to drive it and see what happens. That's it's, it's fun. It's fun to be able to set the tone defensively, maybe before the teams even step on the court. It's, it's amazing how this is not in vogue anymore. And uh, it's just so effective, as you said, taking teams out of what they want to do. Uh, starting with the run and jump, then are you, are you trapping up sideline or is it mainly just on turns to the middle that you're going to run and jump? Um, I give them a lot of freedom, really. Um, one of our trapping rules is if you're so close, you can guard two. So that would be more of a run and jump style. If they're drilling up the sideline, someone's at half court, um, you know, you can guard two easily. You can guard your man and you can pop up and guard the ball. And then someone can take that, take mine concept and do a little switcheroo. Um, we're obvious. Another rule of double teaming is if you see the back of their head um, and then if your man's behind the line of the ball. So we go with more like double teaming rules than, Hey, if it's going up the sideline, we're going to do a run jump. We want to try to turn back to the middle. So it's, it's more, Hey, if, if you can see this rule kind of start to form or take place, the biggest thing is your commitment. You can't go half-heartedly to trap or half-heartedly to run and jump. You, you've got to commit to it. Um, another tagline we use is one goes, we all go. And so that's something that if someone does go, and I always say two wrongs make a wrong, <laughs> you know, two wrongs do not make a right. So if one goes and maybe they're not right, or maybe they're a little out of position, we all have to go. We all have to commit at that point. And that's probably the hardest thing to train a little bit because they know, Oh, that's not right. She, why is she going to double? I need to stay with my man. Well, no, you, we all got to rotate. So one goes, we all go. We're going to end up all probably rotating off our man. Um, that's a big concept in our defensive system. Well, and imagining it's it's steals on recovery more than at the point of the trap anyways, or the run and jump. That's traditionally what happens, you know, against good teams, isn't it? Yeah, you, you've got to take away one pass, one pass away. Um, I'm never, I always say I'm really mad at my trappers if it gets out to the furthest man, because our, our job is to try to get a, a tipping trap. I call it, you know, a TT tipping trap in there. And a deflection is what you need to do if you're trapping. And so again, that's a skinny that we do. It's you're not just trapping. Well, why are you trying to get a deflection? You might be trying to buy team for your teammate to recover, to take away one pass away, or for them to have a rainbow loft cross court. Um, they shouldn't have that direct pass anytime in a trap. So um, these things are all important that kind of go together and they're understanding it as we go through and the concepts. And again, we'll stop and we'll say, this is the why look at this pass on a tipping trap compared to this pass. And one will kind of zing over there and one will rainbow over there. And it gives you're helping your teammates out by giving them more time to recover. So yeah, definitely. And the randomness that you said, giving your players freedom, that's, we've heard this a lot in ball screen coverages, teams going to more random ball screen coverages, but you're already doing that with your pressure just by giving your players freedom to go or not to go. And that's what's really unsettling for a team, isn't it? Yeah, you, there's no, um, 
scripts on when to go and it's just a read and I think you can teach a little bit of that I mean some players have more defensive instinct than others but I think with those concept and those rules you're already I mean if nothing else you've put them in great defensive position right because you're already off the ball on the ball looking to kind of see when can I trap but technically we've, we've played that little mind manipulation. Hey, you're in great defense. You're off the ball on the ball and you might not go trap, but you're clogging the gap or, you know, you're yo-yoing back and forth between man, you ball. So I think that's really, really important that even if you don't go, you're still in great defensive position because you're always looking to kind of go. And so you're off to the ball and, and you're not hugging your man really ever. You shouldn't be hugging your man in our um, defensive mentality unless you know the ball's coming across half court and you're really making it hard to make that first initial entry pass or it's out of bounds and we're we're tagging and we're denying on the in line uh, this philosophy started a jury but is there any better program in the country to do this at than grand uh grand canyon with the fans and havoc and everything else the energy in that gym is going to be bonkers <laughs> when you get to it this year isn't it I know I've, I've even taught them a few things. Um, for example, we use different terminology when the ball gets picked up. A lot of teams are used to saying dead, 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 dead. Well, we yell five, 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 five. So imagine a arena full of havocs yelling five, five, five. You do not want to be the person to let your man catch the ball. So you're going to get after it. And I think they're going to feed us so much energy. I think it's a fun brand of basketball for fans you know, I, I think the women's game is growing in interest and that's because it's a high level. You're just watching the playoff game and you're, you're seeing the intensity defensively, which I love, which is maybe an anomaly. You're also seeing some high quality offense. And I think for me, just bringing this brand to a place that supports their athletics so much is going to be fun because it's going to be enjoying uh, the, the fans are going to enjoy just the brand of basketball, the pace, the intensity, the effort, um, the energy. That's fun to watch too when you're a fan. So I think they're going to appreciate the, the effort and toughness that goes into our style. And I think it'll be really well received and hopefully we can put on a show every night because this place can get hopping and packing. It absolutely can. And uh, going back to denial in the half court a little bit more than is this an on the line, up the line or more of a top block type of situation in terms of denial? It's on the line, up the line, you know, unless that um, ball is dead, we're nose to nose, we're, I, I say, do not become unattached. What I mean by there is kind of attach yourself with an arm bar, get that denial hand up, nose to nose. You know, but when the, the ball's in live play, we're always up the line, on the line. Um, it's really important we do a super denial drill. So if we're getting in the passing lane and there's a back cut, really we should never be beat. One, we've got good weak side that's kind of shading any cutters. I, I call it a tag, like you would in kindergarten. You touch someone, tag them. So you tag them on the weak side and then um, the off the defender um, that is is getting back cut just flips their head and and they should already have that other hand out their their wingspan is long and palm towards the ball so they're flipping their head and I we do a skinny where we just throw our body at the baseline if we get back cut we're throwing our body at the baseline. usually we get tangled up you know with with the ball and us and that's hard to thread the needle especially with the immense amount of ball pressure we're putting on so um, it's, it's up the line on the line until you're in a situation where we've got that five count going, or it's a dead ball out of bounds. Having used denial at the collegiate level as well. I thought one of the most important things to teach, especially newcomers was that it's not your responsibility. When you get beat, if your check scores, it's not your responsibility. That's all the help in the rotation. Do you have any tricks or tools that you use to teach that to players? Yeah, the, the tagging concept, um, you know, we just we will do a super denial drill. Will someone will come up to the three point line kind of intentionally get beat. Um, and then the, the weak side has to see that and they have to be ready to step over. And it's amazing how many, you know, charge stops we get off of that. They're just throwing the ball and they're looking behind them to receive that basketball. And they all of a sudden they're at the rim and one of our help side defenders is there re ready to take it. And we actually take a lot of charges on the pass too. So even if they're kind of under control, not shooting it, and they see that help rotator defense rotation and they, they kick it to the open man. Well, we'll stay there. And I'll say, take it on the pass. And there they go, taking it on the pass. So um, yeah, that tag concept on the weak side is just kind of shade towards any cutters shade 
Um, I say do both well. You got to be a tagger, but you got to close out to shooters. So we'll do a skinny on that. Often we're kind of in help side or a tagger. I also call it big show because we want to be big on the weak side to deter a, a post entry pass or back cuts. And then we got to go out a little bit. So you're always doing this little dance back and forth where you're getting a, a piece of the paint and then out to your man, piece of the paint out to your man. You should never have, you know, two feet stuck in the sand. I love it. Your terminology is great. And uh, th that's another thing you mentioned already a little bit and talk about uh, the the effort of your opponent to be able to attack your weak side, because that's one of the tendencies of a team that's in denial is that you might have more vulnerabilities on the weak side. So can you talk a little bit about your in and out philosophy on the weak side defensively? Yeah, because we're a little positionless and you're probably already switched on someone that's not in your position. Um, anytime there's obviously weak side rotation and um, let's say someone back cuts or gets beat on the dribble. We're going to step over and then get, let's say, two people on the weak side. You're just zoning up. Um, and that one person guarding two is going to the closeout. So they could pitch it to the corner or, you know, wing. Um, and it's your responsibility to go on the closeout. And again, that's a take mine situation um, where we're in scramble. And so the person that got beat is probably coming out to the, the one person that's open. And it's you're always probably going to zone up between the two furthest players. Now, however, we, we say we always want to leave the furthest player open. So in that instance, that's going to have to hopefully be a, a closeout for someone. But if you get beat, you're always running to that weak side. Um, and that's really, really important. It's not like you're, you're, it's not like you're chasing the ball. You know how kindergartners, there's five people playing defense on the basketball. You're not chasing the ball when you get beat. You're going to go take mine. That's why the take mine concept is so important because when you get beat, you got to yell, take mine. And then you're going to look who's open um, while that backside kind of zones up and buys you some time to get to that next pass. Uh, you referenced switching and uh, switching everything. So on the weak side of the floor, are they sometimes switching to be able to keep big at the rim and little's out in terms of who's in and who's out on that weak side? Yeah. Um, really i feel like we're playing with all guards at least in the the concept that they can guard everywhere and yep. then we've got a philosophy in the post where defensively i want you to post up if you kind of think about that it makes sense so if we're playing post defense it's essentially a front but you're trying to bury like i don't want you just to front you can front and get pushed up the line you can front and not be in a stance when you're fronting, you're almost asking the balls like I will give anyone, you know, you can choose our training table meals for the rest of the year. if Someone throws you the ball <laughs> because you're posting them up on defense. So it actually happened once in practice. And I was like, it doesn't count in practice but <laughs> <laughs> in a game. So in a game defensively post defense, we post up like we use our field goals. We get our arms out. We try to bury them kind of shorten that margin of air for a lob. So we want to bury them under the basket, just like you would on a regular post up except you're playing defense. So um, that could be a guard. So we sometimes, and guards are feisty. I was just, uh, you know, I was watching the other day a, a WNBA game, they're switching everything. And it was harder to get the ball inside on the guard than it was the post because they're just fighting and scrapping and fronting and pushing. And so we teach um, some feisty post defense. And again, it can be one through five that's in there guarding. I just had this conversation with uh, some WN or some NBA people. And the concept being that, also the psychology of the official, a smaller player gets away with more fouls in the post when they defend the post, don't they? So I love that terminology you just used. Yep. Uh, so we talked about switching, covering the post a little bit. Are there any other ton of tips or tools for better switching? Because I know this is a trend in basketball in general that more teams are switching. Yeah, you know, off ball, we we literally come together on screen. So if you can kind of picture in your mind that ball getting reversed and just going to set it down screen um, from the wing, we'll switch, but you're susceptible to a slip. So we'll have our hands spread out and we'll come together. So literally the, the top person's bottom hand and the bottom person's top hand are touching on a switch. And that is when you can switch. Only when you touch is when you can switch. So you really are kind of almost building a wall. I know this would be easier to like see, visualize um, on court, but you're almost building a wall. And then at the point of contact, um, you're switching high and the other person's taking low. Now you obviously have to jump under towards the ball so you don't get face cut too on that switch. But I think it's really important to come together on screens. And that's the biggest thing kind of that we focus on on a, a switch 
Uh, you, you referenced the two seconds to get the ball over half as a preference. I'm wondering, what are some other things that you do to, to help your players understand the feel of the pace that you want on both offense and defense? Um, you know, we do, everyone probably has done this drill where we set up our primary break, whatever that is, we'll have, we'll have essentially five scores. Everyone has to score. Um, and you do that in the 30 second shot clock. And that's kind of a good, that's hard to do. So we'll do one. You don't start the time until there's a rebound. There's a rebound. Um, you kick it ahead for a rim run. Um, that's one. The second one is a same side three. So you'll kick it ahead, get that same side three, and you're probably not going to make the 30 seconds if you don't make all these shots too. So it's really tough. Um, the third one is just a diagonal rim run. So probably the guards, um, they're getting to the outside. They're your flyers. We, we tell them to tee up. So they yell T, T, T. So they have to touch essentially where it makes a T from the sideline to half court. Um, that area that would make a T and come together. So they've got to touch that. We get a diagonal pass. Um, the next one is the point guards cross a nail and score. So that's, that would take some time if it takes them six dribbles to get up the court. Um, if it takes them three dribbles to get up the court, they want to push it and cross the nail. And the last one is a trail three. So point guards kind of get to that free throw line, pitch it back, trail three. And again, you probably have to make all those shots to make it within 30 seconds, but that's the pace we want to see transition in. Um, obviously we're going to work the whole 30 seconds for a defensive giveaway or for a defensive stop. And that's something that's really important in our shell that we do is when it's 10, nine, eight, we're going to switch everything and make it really hard. Um, on three, two, one, we really flood the ball. So the closest person, when there's not that time for an extra pass, um, you're kind of flooding the ball. So you feel that pressure and there's usually a throw up shot or a pass and it, it doesn't get off. So um, if we can play defense for 30 seconds, really solid defense, and then stick to those principles after 10 and then finish it with a rebound, you know, that's really what we're measuring defensively. And then, you know, that that's a, that's a tough 30, 30 second primary break that we do. And you can do anything, whatever your break involves, you can kind of manipulate it um, to your specific times and specific shots that you want to get in the break. Uh, great stuff. Uh, good to get an understanding of how you practice as well. And uh, talk to us a little bit about how you manage substitutions with this up up tempo style of play. I think it's so fun to recruit to this style of play <laughs> because freshmen come in and like, oh, wait, what? I'm starting or I'm playing right away or I'm getting double digit minutes. It's like we recruit to play right away because we have to go deep into our bench. So my favorite is when I can tell someone's given it their all and they're like, coach, I need a break. And we're like, no, you, you can't have a break. You have to stay in there. We're like, okay, yeah, we'll get, we'll sub in and out. Let me know when you're fresh and ready and we'll get you in for the next person that needs a break. It's just, it's, it's fun to play because you're, you know, you've got an opportunity and you're going to get a shot to get out there and, and make a difference and cause some havoc, no play on words there. But I think for us, um, recruiting is huge because we got to recruit kids to come in and play right away and make an impact. Um, you know, my first year here, we started two freshmen. So I think that's exciting. Um, we're playing, we're, we're going deep as some people are going like six, seven, um, in February, you know, we're still nine, 10, 11. So I think it's definitely a, a great place to like earn your keep just because if you go hard and you play with effort and defense, you're probably going to play, which is a, it, it's great brand because you get a lot of bodies going in and out and you tend to stay fresh and they're all making a, an impact. Are you subbing based on fatigue? Or are you subbing based on, you know, certain times for players? How, how does it actually happen for you in terms of substitution? And then I guess the other part is that are you subbing mainly based on defense or is it a blend of offense and defense? Yeah, you, you want to have a good mix in there. Um, you know, sometimes we get into substitution patterns like, gosh, we got to get a score in there. We need we need someone to score. <laughs> and that's really important um, offensively. But uh, we don't have um, – a pattern that we're doing based on time or rotations. Like if some, if you can tell someone's getting fatigued, it, that's the beauty of the system is everyone has to be on the same page and everyone has to be going their hardest. So if there's one person that you can kind of tell is, is gas, you're able to 
um, sub them out, but then sub them right back in when they get their second wind. And so we try to just stay fresh all the time on the defensive end. So we're really looking just for, because again, it takes five people. It only takes one person and the, you're kind of out of whack. So we're just looking for fresh legs or that extra effort, especially if you're in denial, you can kind of tell if someone doesn't want to cut and move back and they're letting their man catch, then that's a good sign of, Hey coach, I'm tired. I need to come out and they don't even have to say it. It's just defensive effort that I know. What, what are some of the analytics that you care about? Like I imagine with a pressing type of style, lineup efficiencies and who plays well together matters maybe a little bit more, but what are some other things that uh, you value? You know, I am not a huge stat person, believe it or not. Like my assistant coaches, they're not sitting there taking stats the whole game. Um, We, there's two things that I want to control. It's like, it's body language and effort. That's the only two things I, and everything else takes care of itself. I mean, obviously after the game, you'll look over. I, I always want to see that high turnovers force number. I mean, most of the year this year, we were leading the nation in that and second in steals. So you know, when you're getting those extra possessions from your defense, that's a good thing. Um, this year, we're going to look a little bit more at conversion rate. I think valuing those possessions that we just worked so hard to get. Um, if we're on a three on two or we get a steal, we need to convert. So I'd say that's at the top of the priority list that we've been statting a little bit at practice is if we do come up with a, a steal and live ball steals are great. You know, if, if you get a five second, the team can go down, get set up, but we really want to try to convert um, offensively when we have the advantage off that steal. So that's probably been, and again, I'm not, it's going to be quality over quantity. I'm not going to say, okay, we want conversion rate. We want to look at, you know, efficiency on, on rebounds and allies. We want to look at field goal percentage. I like, there's just, that's the number one goal right now is to be able to, well, no, we're going to get the steal to be able to score off those steals and convert. So it's not just for nothing, you know, all that effort. That's probably the main one that we're going to kind of focus in on this year for sure. So you referenced a little bit uh, fun to recruit to this style. Um, you've also referenced this in a few articles just about that you feel you have an unorthodox approach to recruiting. Can, can you explain that a little bit deeper? Um, I mean, <laughs> I, I, we're going to go out, we're going to see players, but it's going to take time to build these relationships. I mean, that first day that you could call 23s, we did, we called them and we talked to them, but we didn't make one offer that day. And it's because we had had a great chance to like really talk to them. And we finally got to see them live in the summer. So they fit the basketball checklist, but we hadn't got to talk to them a lot, except a couple of times that they call us. So I would say I'm, I'm slow to offer, but not because I don't believe that someone could help the system, but just because relationship is so important to me and I want it to be a good fit on both sides. You know, I want them to feel like they can come here and succeed as a student athlete, but I also want myself and my staff. And then the other kids that I have a a commitment to, you know, to, to make sure we're bringing in like-minded people, good character people, people that, you know, are going to work hard like them and compliment them and add to the culture. And so I just think that piece takes some time and, I think it's valuable for us to to not pull the trigger so quickly just because they're a great basketball player. We we know that, but that they'll be happy and and fit the culture for four years. I've always said culture is a it's a tough thing to get to, but it's even a harder thing to maintain just with the nature of recruiting and open door, the, the revolving door, and then the transfer portal. So. I've got a responsibility to the kids that I already have on the team to make sure that that process is not overlooked or rushed. And so um, I think it's worked for us. And I think um, kids appreciate that. You know, if, if kids are just coming and looking for the quick offer to fill the shoe box, then, you know, is, is that really a kid that would benefit from how we operate and do things? So I think you got to look at it from both sides. Yeah, I love that. Good, good approach, good philosophy. And coach, we know it is working based on <laughs> your success. So we can say that. I think we're safe to say that at this point. But uh, chicken or the egg. So how much does defense dictate your offensive philosophy or vice versa? Which came first for you? Uh, defense will always take priority. 
it's kind of funny because my assistants are like, you know where we rest, we rest on offense. (laughs) So it's like, you've got to give and take a little bit, you know, what you're going to focus on, you're probably going to be good at. And some of those other things could lack, but then you can't, you know, you can't die a thousand deaths over a turnover, which I don't, which I think is a great philosophy too, is, um, you know, I'm not quick to pull, let's say they, they make a turnover an errant pass or, or travel, you know, that's not something that really upsets me because you can really change my mentality. Like I can see you travel, but then if you, you know, next play, if you're going to tag nose and nose, if you get in a stance and you get a five second call, like that's short term memory for me, like you can turn it around on defense. So you can always make up for any mistakes defensively. And I think that's a, another reason why our kids play so free is I'm not quick to yank. It's just, if you, if, if you have effort, then you'll be fine. If, if you not, if you won't be able to play in the system without that effort and energy. Um, and so for me, it's, offensively that's probably we're going to give a little bit and not maybe be as polished but we're working on it you know I think year two we're focusing a little bit more I mean it really did take a whole year to implement this defensive system so now hopefully we can complement it a little bit on the other side of the ball and, and polish some things up there but um, when both get going and clicking you know I still want to focus on defense but obviously for example that conversion that we're talking about that's a big offensive key for us this year um, I think we're, we want to be a better shooting team this year. So, you know, just getting game like shots up and again, some of those are give and take, you can all, there's only 24 hours in the day and you don't get nearly enough time, you know, in the gym, to, you get 20 a week to, to practice in season. So it's just, what do you want to be good at? And you want to hang your hat on that. So I don't, I don't want to be, you know, a, a jack of all trades, master of none type team i want to master a few things and that be your identity and brand and be really really good at it yeah it makes sense and uh, you may not know the number but one in one acc program told me 18 to 21 percent of their possessions were unstructured and they didn't press so i'm imagining your number is quite a bit higher so maybe talk to me about how and the importance of playing in unstructured offensive possessions based on again the number of steals and the, the, the havoc that you create Yeah, that's why we're not spending, I don't have a playbook, you know, four inches thick. We're not doing, we're not memorizing a bunch of plays. That would be pointless with how we play defensively. So what we're doing offensively is, I mean, we're motion. If we, if we take away the ball or even on a make, we'll get it out and get it quick and we'll try to score off the break. But then if not, we don't have to stop, get it to the top of the key, get to our spots, get like you just flow into motion. So what we do a lot of offensively is space cuts off of dribble penetration, I think is super important. Like we could do those, we need to do those every day. So when there's a dribble drive, you know, the drifts, the, the post player relocation, um, creating passing lanes, playing off two feet off dribble penetration, um, I think that's all really, really, really important in our system, whether you're playing three on two, you know, four on three or five on five off of a, a steal. So we're doing a lot of movement off of dribble penetration. Um, and then screen reads, I mean, we're motion. So if you're setting a down screen, if they're in your hip pocket, you got to curl. If they're, if they're cheating towards the lane, you've got a, a fade and just, Um, shots off of motion and then spacing is huge. So, you know, reading screens, spacing, and then moving with and off of penetration is something that we're focused on instead of a lot of those um, go to A, screen at B, cut at C, you know, shoot at D. (laughs) Yeah, you couldn't do that based on how you play, could you? Right. No, it's it's definitely, it would, it would totally um, derail even our defensive mentality of getting a steal and going. And we want to keep pace. We want to, we want to dictate tempo and pace. And so I think that's important on both ends. And so that style you're going to see, that's fun to play too, because that's teaching basketball, really. We're not spending an hour practice memorizing plays. We're making reads and we're reacting. So, uh, it's fun to practice too. It's just basketball. I love it. And uh, positionless as well. You've already talked about that on defense and you're already set up to be positionless on offense, aren't you? Yeah. I mean, typically you're going to all be able to stretch the floor and and be some guards. You know, we want to, we want to play up to our strengths. So if we don't have, you know, a quote unquote post player, that's a great shooter. We'll put them in the ghost a little bit, have, let them have some free range when to duck in, maybe even pop out to like a five out look every once in a while, if they can stretch the floor. So, um, 
there's some freedom in that, but you also want to try to kind of dictate what that looks like based on the basketball player you are. So, you know, if, if someone's a good slasher, maybe they're putting the ball on the deck a little bit more. Um, if someone's a good shooter, maybe they're running to the corners and being available for um, penetrators. So I think it's just, you, you got to look at your personnel. And so that's evolving for us every year as we kind of change the look of the team. And then in this, in this philosophy, uh, how, how important is the three point shot relative to what you want to do? I think it's important. I mean, we're not going to be that team that um, every open look we get, we're going to jack it unless you got, you know, a, a green light, you're kind of that green light shooter. But um, I think what is really important about the three point shot is you playing off penetration. You've got to have your feet set and ready. I'll take an inside out three is so great. But, you know, if, if you're off balance and we're just swinging it and it wasn't a great pass and you're kind of open, like we're going to pass that one up. So it's not bombs away as soon as you feel, you know, any sort of space. Um, I tell them there's, I've got four rules. You have to check each one of them off to be able to shoot the three. It's, are you open? <laughs> That's rule number one. Are you on balance? Are you in rhythm? And are you in range? And so for maybe one of our posts, if they're wide open on the three, but they're not in range, you know, they're not, we're not going to shoot that because it, it, they're not in range. So on balance and in rhythm is something we're working on too. Um, so it's not like shoot every three that you're open. You kind of have to have those checks um, before you can let her, let her fly. But I do, it's an important part of the game. It's, it's definitely something that is more of an emphasis um, these days. And I think you've got to have a three point shot to be able to compete. And that's obviously going to open up a lot more for you. Um, anyways, if you've got some outside shooters that can knock down the three. How much of this philosophy is, ref is reflected on how you like to play? Because I'm imagining that this was a fun philosophy that you would have loved to play in. Yeah, probably all of it. <laughs> Honestly, I'm a, I'm a short, you know, five, six, my stature puts me in the ankle biter category. So I always had to earn my keep on the defensive end with a lot of just scrappy, tenacious effort. So I hope that's even kind of how I coach and that trickles down that energy trickles down to my team. Um, but I'm the product of a coach's kid. My dad coached all our AU and summer programs and he instilled my love of defense. So a lot of these concepts and thoughts are from him and they've kind of evolved um, throughout the years as I've kind of tinkered and toyed and kind of understood a little bit more. So I've gotten into my coaching career, what works and what doesn't. So I definitely played a lot like how I'm teaching. I'm sure he's very proud watching and uh, I love talking to pressing coaches. And one of the questions that I love asking them is about scouting report, because I think it's, it's, it's not talked about enough how scouting report comes into play with pressing teams. For example, a player on the opposing team catches the ball who you want to have the ball. And then is there a call for five, five, five at that point, even though they have a live dribble that you want them to be able to handle the ball instead of say another player. Yeah. I mean, we, we, let's say the ball gets in to their non point guard and we really want to pressure. Um, we, we call this a, a, a yard dog. I mean, our, our offense is dog. Um, that's our man to man or defense, excuse me. Our man to man defense is, is dog. So yard dog is like you, we are in a situation where we don't want anyone else to get the ball and, and we're shading even initially towards that primary ball handler. So whoever's guarding the inbounder, will kind of shadow that primary ball handler um, and in yard dog. So if they, you know, if number two is their point guard and she's really the only one that can efficiently get the ball up the floor with pressure, we'll yard dog her. So we'll, we'll put basically two people on her so she can't get the ball. And then if it goes into a, a different guard or an off guard, then everyone else kind of goes into denial mode and we're looking to trap that. I, I mean, sometimes they're saying, okay, well then don't let the point guard still catch the ball. Well, then she can kind of bring it down maybe with a little bit of ball pressure, but we're really looking to trap her. Um, we want to make her really uncomfortable. So that might be a little bit of a different philosophy instead of, well, let her bring it down. No, let's, let's make her even more uncomfortable than she already is. Right. Let's make her into a decision that. maker that she's not yeah. used to being right. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, yeah, that yard dog concept we might uh, based on scout. Um, and a lot of teams we actually have seen mix up their starting lineup to where 
you know, they're put their second person on the depth chart they they have two point guards. And um, so that's been something that has been unique too, because then that gets them out of whack a little bit because, well, I'm used to playing point when I come in, but now I'm playing the two. And so uh, I think that's been interesting as well, but we do a really good job also of our, our that person guarding the ball um, is typically always one of our better defenders. So they can make reads on when to go, when to deny the ball back. If their person gets the ball back, they're capable and able to play tough on ball defense and work them into a turn. So um, yeah, it's, it all, it all matters scout. That's for sure. Um, who you want handling the ball, who you, um, knows their primary ball handler for us. Are, are you finding teams are changing who they're inbounding with against you as well? And on, the, on that as well, you're playing against more set inbound plays when it's a dead ball situation in the full court as well, aren't you? Yeah. And we'll make adjustments. I actually love it when teams try to put their point guard as the inbounder. Um, because that's when we're really going to try to deny that ball back and we'll move our, I call him the center fielder, but we'll move our person who's guarding the inbounder almost up over the ball. Um, so we'll make that adjustment. Yeah, it, we've, we've seen everything, the five, one through five, throw it in. Um, but now that we have seen a lot, we can usually make a pretty easy adjustment based on what they're trying to do. Um, and we kind of have a, a an adjustment for every scenario, whether that's bringing four up, you know, to try to inbound it one up, two up, three up, whatever it is, we, we kind of play those scenarios out in practice too, and have a good idea of what that looks like for us defensively. Coach, I I've seen, uh, you're willing to share. Uh, I I've noticed you've spoken at a lot of clinics. You've obviously presented on a few podcasts, different things like that. You are a giver and that's part of your philosophy, no doubt. Yeah. My husband always teases me a little bit. He's like, why are you giving all the secrets away? <laughs> I think Pat Summit was the one like, I don't know if they can replicate it. It takes us like a year to figure it out. So I just, any tidbit that coaches can pick up by, you know, listening to a podcast or watching a clinic or coming to practice. I mean, open invite. I don't mind that at all. Um, I've had fellow, you know, college coaches come to practice. So that's something that I would encourage. Um, Cause I think there's, how we grow the game is just knowledge sharing. And I love to do that, go to practices. So, um, and then the fun thing is if, if they get to games and see how it all plays out, you know, what I've been talking about for the last hour, kind of watch it in action. So we want to invite people to come to practice and come to games and we can definitely get tickets. And I think that's something that is, is really powerful when you can like hear it all and then see like, Oh, that's what she was talking about. So um, yeah, open invite and my phone lines open, my emails open. I always love talking basketball. Well, we appreciate that generosity. And uh, I think another generosity is you modeling parenting, which I think has been so important. And you, just a quick view of your timeline on your Twitter account, and social media is that you're proud of obviously being a parent and you're proud of showing that side of it off, which is so important in the women's game, isn't it? To be able to mentor coaches and females in particular about being a parent and being a coach at the same time. It is. I, it's such my passion. I mean, I love my kids with all my heart. I love my basketball kids with all my heart. And I'm in a profession where fortunately I can blend the two often. Um, does one take from the other sometimes? Sure. But I don't, I, I, I feel like if you focus on that, you're just going to feel like you're disappointing one of those groups. And I focus on the positive of, Hey, when my team's over at my house, my kids are adoring the time with them. They love it. If I can get, you know, my daughter to practice and do warm up lines, then she thinks mommy's work is the coolest thing instead of, you know, mom's not here. She's a, she's with the lopes, not me. So I think the more you can hype up the, the blending of the two and, you know, just setting an example, I think, especially women in coaching, um, they feel pressure to be it all and do it all, but just where your feet are, do that well. And for me, I, I love being a parent. I try to you know, find time to go to the soccer practice, but I'm going to miss one or two, um, you know, for, for our, I've got great support around me from my assistant coaches, you know, to my husband, my, my parents, my in-laws, everyone's picking up pieces to help watch. So that might be, um, you know, if I do want to make a Saturday soccer game, one of my assistants are like, well, Hey, I'll, I'll take this uh, recruiting trip this time. So you, you balance and that's the best thing you can do. But 
everyone that's you know in that situation you you can do it especially if you just look at it as a as a positive instead of being pulled so many directions and um until they figure out a way to clone you know <laughs> we're gonna have to do both well and i'm very very fortunate that i've got such um a supportive group at gcu but then at home to allow me to be able to be a mom, but be a coach. And so I wouldn't have it any other way. And again, that's something that I love talking about also. So unsolicited advice, I would, <laughs> I love to like share tidbits with fellow parents out there. So my line's also open to um, the parents that want to share knowledge and tips and tricks. <laughs> Well, that's awesome. And I cannot thank you enough for sharing the game with us, coach. Just so much wonderful stuff. And uh, I know so many people will be wanting to check out your team this year and, uh, you know, open practices, invites and attend all those things. So thanks for sharing the game with us. For sure. Thanks for having me and good luck to everyone this season.